Good afternoon, and welcome to this meeting of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Maritime Uses. I'm Council Member Adrian Adams, the Chair of this committee. We are joined today by Council Member Ku. Today we will hold public hearings on two applications and one bill. Proposed introduction number 212-A. Due to a scheduling conflict, the previously scheduled hearing on intro 368 by Council Member Salamanca, a local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to authorizing the Landmarks Preservation Commission to administer a historic preservation grants program is deferred to a future date. The first two items we will hear relate to an application to use land in Queens for cemetery purposes. The first of those items is LU51, an application submitted by Montefiore Cemetery pursuant to Section 1506 of the New York State Not-for-Profit Corporation Law for approval to use real property for cemetery purposes in relation to property located at Block 12695, Lots 1521 and 101 in Council Member Miller's District in Queens. Though state law authorizes the council to approve an application to use real property in Queens for cemetery purposes, the administrative code prohibits cemeteries in Queens from engaging in, in such use. Therefore, to give effect to Montefiore's application, we will also hear proposed introduction to 12-A by Council Member Miller, a local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to approval of cemetery uses on land acquired in Queens before 1973. This bill will allow a cemetery corporation that owns land in Queens to use up to two additional acres acquired before 1973 for cemetery uses, provided such land is across the street from the existing cemetery and such cemetery corporation first obtains approval for such use from the council. Representatives of Montefiore Cemetery will present on both of these items today. We'd like to call the witnesses of uh, for Montefiore Cemetery at this time. Anthony Biliosi. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Okay. <laughs> All right. So before you begin, can you please identify yourself for the record? Turn your mic on and repeat. Anthony J. Bielsi. Thank you so much. I'd like to um, uh, uh, <coughs> welcome Councilmember uh, Miller um, to um, to um, to speak as well. Okay, he will pass. The floor is yours. Please, please begin. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. Uh, as I stated, my name is Anthony Bielsi. I'm the president of Montefiore Cemetery located in southeast Queens. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present our applica application, LU-51, and testify today in support of Intro 212-A. Established in 1908 as a cemetery for burial of the individuals of the Jewish faith and operated by the nonprofit Springfield Long Island Cemetery Society, Montefiore Cemetery is located along Springfield Boulevard in southeast Queens. The existing cemetery covers 114 acres with presently over 156,000 burials. In order to accommodate the demand for par parking during a time of high burial and visitation activity, Montefiore acquired an approximately two-acre property directly across the street from the cemetery between Springfield Boulevard and Nashville Boulevard between 122nd and 121st Street. I'm sorry, 121st Avenue in four separate purchases, 1956, 1958, 1963, and in 1972. A variance was obtained to use the property for par parking and construction of a maintenance area for cemetery equipment. Visitors would park across the street and walk to visit the graves. Over time, the burial and visitation rate diminished, lessening the need for the ancillary parking lot. It has been some years since the property across Springfield Boulevard has been used for parking. 
The property block 12695, lots 101, 21, and 15 is no longer needed for ancillary parking and is reverted back to R3A. The cemetery continues to maintain its variance on lot one for our maintenance facility. Today, the cemetery is almost completely full. The Springfield Long Island Cemetery Society has expressed its desire to convert this former parking lot into an expanded grave space at Montefiore Cemetery, cemetery in order to plan for the future meet and meet our demand. We have spent the last two years briefing elected officials, community boards, civic associations, and other community and, and others in the community about our plans and have received overwhelmingly positive feedback. There are several advantages of this expansion to both cemetery and the community. We will be able to meet the demand for Jewish burials in the borough of Queens, saving the New York-based families the expense and inconvenience of traveling to locations outside the city. This will also improve the long-term financial stability of the cemetery, benefiting many thousands of family members who rely upon us to maintain the burial sites of their loved ones. In conversations over the last two years, community members have repeatedly expressed their preference of the expansion of the cemetery over commercial development of the property. The community will see a vacant lot transformed into a low-impact, permanent green space that will serve a natural extension of the cemetery that has itself been a fixture in the community since 1908. Specifically, we plan to create a green space that will allow for up to 2,000 new graves. The site will feature landscaping, screening, fence around the perimeter. It will be completely maintained by the staff of Montefiore Cemetery and will be an extension of the cemetery. The same visiting hours at the cemetery will extend to the, prop extend to the property. Sunday to Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., we are closed on Saturdays and all Jewish holidays. The only alternative for the cemetery's board of directors consistent with their fiduciary obligations would be to sell the property to the highest bidder, something the cemetery does not wish to do. We are very pleased that the application LU51 and intro 212-8 will enable the cemetery to expand graves onto this property. We are particularly grateful to the sponsor, Councilman Danique Miller, for his thoughtful leadership and support. Thank you, and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by council members Traeger and Menchaca. Uh, as one who has been a resident of the community for a very long time, this is uh, a venture that is a long time coming, uh, and uh, we're glad to see you here today. Uh, council member Miller. Yes, good afternoon. So I, I do have one or two questions, and so in terms of, uh, the development of this, these two acres here, have you, uh, in, um, this in the past was uh, additional parking for Montefiore. What are the parking provisions that have been put in place uh, um, for your plan? Do you do have a plan for development already? We have some preliminary drawings, yes, there would be some parking within the two acre property uh, to accommodate, you know, visitation, some visiting over there. Um, there's still parking across the street at the cemetery. They can park there and they can walk across the street if they so be. Okay, so you don't anticipate much off-street parking? We don't anticipate much at all. Currently, we don't even see that now. We have our, the parking we have on our, this on, at our building now <coughs> is more than adequate for the, um, for the um, visitation. Okay. Um, your Montefiore, <coughs> Montefiore shares this acreage, the cemetery with what what all denomination is Montefiore exclusively <coughs> excuse me exclusively a Jewish cemetery. Yes, and the other portion of the cemetery is. I'm sorry, what other portion are you talking about? The other portion of the cemetery along Springfield Boulevard, um, <coughs> on the on the uh, east side. You, you, are we talking about that non-denominational cemetery in between us? Is that what we're talking about? Or that is correct. Yeah, th we have nothing to do with them. They are, they're a completely separate entity. And who are they? I have no idea. It just says Springfield Cemetery on it. I, I, it has no affiliation with us whatsoever. Okay. <coughs> uh, 
Um, could you speak very briefly about the responsibility of a Jewish cemetery, uh, <coughs> which allows them to cohabitate with the existing Springfield Cemetery and or what would permit or, or <coughs> not permit others from being buried in that cemetery? Our charter, sp our charter specifically states that uh, it's for burials of the Jewish faith only. Um, it's been that way since it was established in 1908. Um, I believe that other cemetery you're, you're, you're talking about is, an, is a, a non-sectarian, non-denominational cemetery um, uh, where any faith, I believe, can be buried there from, from what I understand. So there's no such provisions that would permit others other than the Jewish faith to be buried there? No, absolutely not. As I said, you know, our, our, our charter specifically states with the, that we're, you know, of the Jewish faith. And we've been such we've been that way since our inception in 1908. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the committee, Councilmember Kuhn? So uh, to follow through uh, Councilmember Miller's questions, I mean cemetery is something I I didn't know anything about, so. So, uh, so there's such a thing that, that if it's a Jewish cemetery, other people cannot apply to buy a plot there? No, that is correct. They, they would have to be of the Jewish faith. It's legal? Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay, because, because under the, for, for, for living persons, you know, it's very hard to prohibit certain ways to say you cannot buy a house in this neighborhood. But when you die, you can do it. Right. <laughs> So <laughs> there's something funny about it. Yeah. I, I thought when we go to heaven, we are the same, you know? We are, it doesn't matter what race we are from. <laughs> so this is something that now, I didn't know anything about before. Yes. So, uh, but this is true also under un, other uh, denomination, uh, the Catholic cemetery. You had to be Catholic to be buried there, right? Well, that's a religious cemetery. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you'd ha you would have to be Catholic. So for your cemetery, you had to be Jewish. Yes. So, and, and how much does it cost to buy a burial park there? Currently? Yeah. About $15,000 a grave. 15000 for how, how big a park? Yeah. That's for one, one grave, one um, eight feet by three foot grave. But three by, three by five foot? No, eight feet by three feet. Eight, eight by three feet, yeah. So what happens if it's, uh, is the cemetery is full? Like you said before, there's no more space. What happens when a cemetery is, is full is, is that th their operating income basically disappears and the cemeteries have to live off whatever investments they have in order to maintain. They have to, you know, we're obligated and we have a duty to maintain the cemetery. So by expanding it, we, we you know, our operating income then will can, can continue for maybe another 20 years or so, you know, so, and again, and it, it allows for, you know, burials of people of the Jewish faith to stay within Queens and not have to go to Long Island or not have to go to some other, some other, um, some other borough. I mean, when you buy a plot, do you have to pay a, a monthly maintenance fee to no. do the cleanup and all those things? No. No. So, there's no no charge for that. Uh, and, and there would be just one time fee. There would only be a charge if the if the individual planted or put something on the grave and at that point there would be you know a maintenance charge but if if a, per, if a person didn't no there would be no charge so there's no further charges in that it providing they put nothing on the grave no uh, all right thank you thank you council member Koo. are there any further questions from the committee okay thank you thank you for your time. step down are there any members of the public that wish to testify? Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on LU 51. The last item we will hear is LU 63, an application submitted by the Administration for Child Services and DCAS, pursuant to Section 197-C of the New York City Charter, 
for the acquisition of property for the continued use as St. Anthony's Community Daycare Center. The site is located at 4917 Fourth Avenue, that's Block 783, Lot 1, in Councilmember Menchaca's district in Brooklyn. Representatives of the Administration for Children's Services will present on this item, followed by testimony from the public. DCAS will also present. If you wish to speak on this or any item on today's agenda, please fill out an appearance slip. We welcome the first panel, Allison Grant of ACS and Dale Laserson of DCAS. I hope I said that correctly. Okay, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and in response to all council members' questions? I do. Thank you very much. Before you begin your testimony, will you please identify yourselves for the record? My name is Allison Grant, and I'm the Chief of Staff for the Division of Child and Family Wellbeing at the Administration for Children's Services. My name is Dale Lazerson. I'm a, I am an Assistant Director of Leasing at DCAS in the Real Estate Services Group. Thank you very much. You may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Adams and members of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Maritime Uses. As I stated, my name is Allison Grant, and I'm the Chief of Staff for the Division of Child and Family Wellbeing at, within the New York City ACS. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. The Division of Child and Family Wellbeing aims to engage families before they reach the child welfare system with resources and services to help them thrive. CFWB, our division's acronym, focuses on the factors that contribute to family well-being, including health, education, employment, and culture, and uses place-based and population-based approaches to engage families, children, and communities. CFWB's scope includes the agency's community partnerships programs, safe sleep initiative, early care and education, primary prevention services, and a new office of equity strategies that works to identify strategies to reduce inequities, implicit bias, and other factors that contribute to disparate outcomes for families and communities that we serve. CFWB currently oversees the city's early care and education system, which includes the early learn contracted system and the provision of childcare vouchers. Our system serves almost 100,000 children from ages six weeks to 13 years of age, approximately 30,000 of whom are served within early learn. ACS's Early Learn program is specifically developed to provide high quality, holistic early child, early child education that provides social and intellectual development for young children. My testimony today pertains to a lease renewal for one of ACS's Early Learn sites, St. Andrew's Community Daycare. This daycare is operated by Sunset Bay Community Services and is located within St. Andrew's Episcopal Church at 4917 Fourth Avenue, Brooklyn, New York 11220 in Community District 7 and Council District 38. The daycare occupies a total of 8,971 square feet, 6,000 square feet of which is exterior and 2,971 is interior space, which includes a total of two classrooms. As of April 16th, this daycare center has the capacity to serve 35 children and currently is serving 33. The effective contracted rate for Sunset Bay Community Services is approximately $13,500 per child per year, with the fiscal year 2018 budget of nearly $475,000, including estimated parent fees of $33,000. This site has operated as a daycare center since 1972. The most recent lease began in 1994 and expired in September of 2014, and the daycare has been on a month-to-month -month lease since that time. The pending application is the best opportunity to provide a stable location for the daycare for at least the next several years. The New York City Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, is currently negotiating the lease renewal for St. Andrew's Community Daycare. And my colleague, Dale Lazerson, is next to me and can answer questions about that when we're done with our testimony. St. Andrew's Church is the landlord for the site and has indicated to DCAS that it intends to develop the portion of the property that is currently used as an outdoor playground. While this would impact the daycare program by removing its outdoor play space, all ACS Early Learn sites that do not have playgrounds are required to ensure appropriate opportunities for the development of motor skills and playtime outdoors. Programs that do not have their own outside play spaces use local parks and go on walks to address these needs. In addition, Early Learn sites will be transferring to the Department of Education in 2019, at which point these requirements around the daycare's playtime and motor skills development will be governed by the DOE. 
New York City has held a lease at this location for nearly 50 years in order to provide consistent, high-quality childcare services to the Sunset Park neighborhood. A new lease will allow the current operator to continue to provide high-quality childcare in a stable location for the next several years, and the City Council's approval of this application is critical to achieving this goal. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you about the Early Learn Program at St. Andrews Community Daycare. I look forward to answering any questions you may have regarding the application, as does my colleague Dale Lazarson. <coughs> Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Barron. Councilmember Menchaca. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, to the committee uh, for today's discussion uh, about um, the, uh, the site, the St. Andrews site. Uh, so I want to thank you for, for coming here today and, and talking with us. Um, I know we're not going to be voting today, but it's really important that we understand the, the kind of full, the full application. I also understand that this is this is something that I think we're all aligned on, and we want we want to support, and but it also is connected to a lot of other things that are happening in the city, and we want to make sure that, as much as possible, we inform everyone on the committee and the council and our community ab about what's happening and and why we're here today, and and because this is not the last time we're going to be here uh, across the city for sites, and so I want to make sure that we get stronger in our conversation as we join all all the minds on this. Um, and in fact, yes, all, all across the city, development pressures are threatening the availability and the sustainability of our community facilities and church and synagogue properties are being converted from publicly accessible space into the private and residential space. Meanwhile, in my district in Southwest Brooklyn, District 38, uh, we've seen a dramatic community facility need. K through, th K through 12 schools are operating over capacity Daycare facilities are operating at 98% capacity. And in this context, the quality and the availability and the sustainability of daycare facilities is super critical. And we're hearing from all across the district, from communities uh, uh, who are expressing their interest in this in Spanish and in Chinese, um, Arabic. We're hearing from every, every, every different corner of our community. And the issue before us today is the renewal of a lease at St. Andrew's Church on 4th Avenue to continue to be used as a daycare facility. But our decision about this lease renewal must be informed by knowledge that the property owner is considering developing the playground property adjacent, most likely for several stories of residential units. Uh, again, this is a common story in all our districts. As public agencies and elected officials, it's our duty to ensure that the future quality and availability of the spaces support our children in our neighborhood. So I hope that we, uh, we can come together uh, in public service, in pub as public servants, and find solutions to ensure that the, that the continued availability of these spaces and expansion uh, are developed to provide quality care for our youngest New Yorkers. And so that's my statement. I have a few questions, but uh, I don't know if this is a time to go. Yeah? OK. I'll go right into it. So talk to us a little bit about that idea of of the playground and whether or not we know that it's considered as a possible development site uh, as part of the leased property. Sure, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and respond to your questions. Uh, as late as this morning, the par um, I spoke with the parish. The parish remains consistent in its response. Um, uh, to generate revenue for the parish, uh, the parish is considering disposing of a portion of the lot, which would be the outdoor lot, to a developer. The development RFP went out. Uh, it, it is only issued to, and they are only considering developers that are agreeable to a minimum 30% affordable housing and a community space for daycare center services. So that's good news. Um, whether or not it's actually the award of this is actually conditioned upon that, I don't have an answer, but that is, um, uh, those were two elements of criteria to be shortlisted. Um, with that, there is not an immediate guarantee that that community space for childcare services would necessarily be a city um, specific daycare center site. However, that is the goal as we discussed this morning. And so I think this kind of uh, points to my second question about, you know, during the lease period, what, 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 what does a lease allow us to do in terms of, of that development? 
Sure. So right now, um, the proposed lease will be for a period of just five years because of the development opportunity. Very likely that it will have a kick out by the owner after year two so they can grab a portion of the lease space. The lease space will be considered as premises, uh, both the interior and the lot. And what the owner is considering is that they will have a right to take back the lot after year two, which obviously would affect uh, the operations, the daycare center operations, and, um, and then redevelop. Uh, we're in dialogue about this now. Uh, if we were to allow this um, with uh, our line of sight on hopefully allowing continued daycare centers in the new development, uh, daycare center services in the new site, um, we will work very closely uh, with DOE, SCA, ACS to ensure that the continued operations in the interior of the space are not adversely affected. However, um, way in advance of looking at that construction schedule, if DOE, SCA, uh, and or ACS at the time believe that they will be adversely affected, um, then a relocation, either temporary or on a permanent basis if something is found, would probably be the dialogue at that time. But we intend to incorporate as much flexibility and protections into the lease um, as possible. Uh, thank you for kind of walking us through that. I, I think what I'm hearing though is is that we don't really have a lot of a lot of power here um, beyond leasing and kind of through this action giving the city the power to bring a daycare uh, service to to the property. So the redevelopment question comes in. Uh, they're saying two years before that will happen. Construction might disrupt, and if that happens, there's not much that we can do as a city to say this is how we want to do it. We can propose and have dialogue, so having dialogue is important. But at the end of the day, worst case scenario is we're going to have to relocate for X amount of time unknown until the redevelopment continues. Is that right? Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, most of that is absolutely correct. Much of this is speculative, of course, um, but the good news is is that the parish is in active dialogue with us, and they are committed to not only continuing to provide parish services to the community, but also the daycare services. So through our uh, proposed deal, um, once we get a little farther along with them, which will happen when they get a little farther along with the response on the RFP to see, we expect to sit down at the table to really bake into the deal protections that actually may allow us to be assured of continued services. And one component did come up this morning, um, which I'm free to speak about, which is if uh, the daycare center operator and DOESA or ACS believe that the take back of the lot area during construction will be adverse to the operation, one of the developers um, that is being considered actually has a site in the immediate area and uh, we're hoping that we can further that dialogue about whether or not that site can serve as a relocation site. So we, we expect to have some significant dialogue to really understand the real risk uh, and put as many protective mechanisms around uh, this opportunity as possible. I think what's important here too is I in this decision uh, in partnership, this is, this is partnership, how we, how we can get as much information as possible and you're feeding us a lot of good conversations around negotiations mm -hmm. and what I want to understand too though is you're, you're kind of speaking in the future we're going to bake in later um, do those things happen but can they happen before we essentially give power to all of, can we see essentially the plan before we say yes yes this, I'm sorry that's good. actually happening now My, yeah so okay. I'm, I'm talking about uh, the future it's speculative because the final response on the RFP and the dialogue with the selected developer really between the parish and that select development hasn't happened yet. Right, and so when right will that happen? Do we know? Did the church tell you? I believe the responses have come in and the short list should be in the near future. No, I don't have a definitive date yet. And will that happen before the council votes to move forward on this lease? Um, no, I don't think so, based on your jurisdiction period ending fairly soon. Soon, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but, soon. Um, uh, but this would just allow us to enter into uh, the, the council's approval uh, of yeah. the ULIF application will allow us to enter into any final deal. So right. it's good that we would secure that in advance. But the terms for these protections, all of this will happen. Um, it may not happen before their development deal, but it will certainly ha it's certainly happening now, the dialogue of this. 
And h how much notice would the DOE give in terms of any of one of these issues, redevelopment, because uh, that, that will have an impact. No more, so, no more adjacent site use, adverse impact, relocation. What's the, what's the DOE uh, process or, well, or Neither of us work for DOE, right. so we actually can't speak to that, but we would ask that our intergov would follow up with you to okay. get answers from them. And on the adverse, uh, on the reverse side of that, if the question is also how much will they give give to DOE SCA? This morning I asked for a minimum of one year, one year's notice um, of when anything would occur, including any take back. If if they elect to take back a portion of the space, which would be the outdoor, a minimum one year. Uh, but well in advance of that, we would hope to have continued dialogue and see phasing plans and construction plans, so that DOE SCA could make an informed decision about continuing the operations in the interior space based on the construction plan, what kind of construction barrier and berm may be considered. All of these things would go into the decision that DOE uh, SCA makes. And, um, and, and I totally appreciate, I know that DOE isn't here right now, but we'll definitely follow up with all DOE related questions. And the last two questions that I have are, are really around trying to figure out what other sites are, are in this space and or uh, in, in, tra in the trajectory for for something like this a renewal of the development site is that something you have to share with council um, in general we'll have to get back to you but there should be some kind of list I'm not sure how much information we have because it's always uh, moving targets in terms of negotiations of course right right yep. but it'd be, it'd be really helpful for us to know um, in advance because I think what I'm hearing here and and I have to and where I where I began, we are we are aligned. We want this to happen. We're just trying to figure out how we how we can help you get what you need and us what we need as far as information to ensure that we have a good negotiation, the best kind of negotiation, and arm you with that. We greatly so. appreciate your support. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you so much, and thanks for my colleagues for uh, indulging me in these questions today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Menchaca. I just want to echo the sentiments. Uh, of my colleague, uh, th there is a, a definite need to prioritize uh, space for our daycare centers across the city, especially given um, the mayor's um, newest 3K initiative, which is very, very important to the city of New York, as was pre-K. So uh, speaking as the one who is hearing it now uh, in my own borough of Queens, people are really looking for space um, for, for 3K right now and uh, space is uh, very tough it's difficult to come by so to hear that there's a possibility of perhaps losing the flexibility of your space it's very concerning um, to us on the council and uh, you do have our support um, are there any questions from the committee at this time council member Coon? so uh, what kind of lease you are signing with the landlord here is it uh, 10 year lease or you know, year by year? No, proposed right now will be a very short term of a maximum five years, and that's simply um, due to the correlation of his development timeline. However, with that correlation, uh, they expect that they would like to be under development in approximately three years, four years, so it may very well be it's a five year lease, but uh, with a portion of the space, meaning the outdoor space lost after year two. And this would be from executions. Mm. And how many like, daycare centers ACS operate in the yeah. city? We operate, there are 365 currently operating daycare centers that are part of the early learn contracted system. And about a quarter of those are leased and then an additional uh, approximately dozen are owned by the city. So, so can you tell me the difference between your daycare and any other like private daycare centers? Sure. So uh, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Bureau of Child Care licenses daycare centers for the city, and there's approximately 2,000 child care centers that they license, and they also have a, an agreement with the state, um, DOHMH and OCFS, Office of Children and Family Services, to monitor the uh, family daycare and group family daycare that the state registers versus what city licenses. So of the 2,000 uh, licensed daycare centers that DOH oversees, approximately a, f a quarter um, are early learn. Others are privately operated. Um, others beyond that are obviously our DOE, uh, pre-K, 
and the new 3K programs the chair mentioned. And uh, there are, as I said, group families, so home-based, center-based. Uh, so really, if you walk down the street in your district, you'll see some that might be ACS contracted, some that are DOE contracted, and some that are private. And um, some of them accept vouchers, and some do not. Hmm. But the curriculum is the same, right? Uh, ACS only oversees the early learn curriculum, and almost all of our uh, contracted programs use the creative curriculum. Um, we state that all of them should be using one that's um, based in the, stri the most stringent um, regards to early childhood development, and uh, the DOE and ACS uh, do work together, and, and most of our uh, programs do have the same curriculums in place, um, in addition to their having pre-K and 3K um, additional um, services. Uh, but in terms of the private daycares, we don't monitor or oversee them. We don't know what curriculums they have. Um, we don't oversee their hours or their regulations in terms of their staff. So I can't really speak to that. What about uh, when, when they finish your the daycare center? Do, they, do you encourage them to take the gift and talented programs test? Uh, we share all information in terms of uh, moving when they're two, because uh, you know our early learn centers are from six weeks through four years of age, right? Uh -huh. um, so when they're two, we recommend if they're in a community with 3K, they can continue 3K at an early learn center, or they can apply for DOE 3K. Um, when they tur are turning four, we again recommend staying at early learn pre-K or a separate DOE pre-K. And when they're going turning five and they're going to move on to kindergarten from our programs, we provide all the information in order to apply for kindergarten through the DOE as well as the gifted and talented application. And we encourage the staff at our programs to ensure that all families and guardians are aware of these opportunities because we want to make sure that the low-income children in our system have those opportunities as do all other children across the city. So do you have like st statistics? Like, mm -hmm. like what's the percentage of... Uh, of, uh, of your graduates uh, getting into the gift and talent program? That's a really great question. I don't believe, I, I definitely don't have that today with me. I'll see if we have that available. Um, it might take some data crunching. Oh. Um, to, it might take a little bit to get that back to you, but I can see what we have. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Council Member Lehrer? Council Member Schreiker? Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony today. You may step down. Thank you, Chair. Are there any members of the public that wish to testify on this item at this time? Seeing no further witnesses on this item, I will now close the public hearing on LU 63, and I'd like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, council, and land use staff for attending today's hearing. This meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>